known as the Sturmvogel, Stormbird, or Schwalbe, Swallow. The German Messerschmitt Me-262 revolutionized warfare aviation and wreaked havoc on morale among the Allies during World War II. The very first fighter to use a jet engine, the Me-262 was faster and deadlier than any other fighter, but its mass production was complicated due to metal shortages, design challenges, and interference from Hitler himself. Yet it was one of the most, if not the most, advanced aircraft used during World War II. Tentative Plans Germany successfully tested the world's first practical jet aircraft one week after the invasion of Poland kick-started World War II. Germany had long wanted to integrate the technology to a fighter jet, a thought they'd been playing with since April of 1939, but that could only finally seem tangible after the Hinkle HE-178 turbojet aircraft, developed as a private venture, took off. By request of the Reichsluftfahrtministerium, Dr. Waldemar Voigt and Robert Lusser were tasked under the codename Project 1065 with building a jet fighter, capable of one hour of cruising with a top speed of at least 530 miles per hour or 850 kilometers per hour. Creating the aircraft was challenging, particularly in regard to engine design, both because jet engines were new and because high-ranking officials kept directing funding away from the project, believing that the war could be won quickly and effortlessly with conventional aircraft. At one point early in 1940, the project was cut back to a point where it only had 35 engineers on board. Planning continued, however, and the ME-262 was designed with a swept wing, which featured a leading edge sweep of 18.5 degrees, allowing it to increase its critical Mach limit number. The design presented a fighter more heavily armed and capable of greater speeds than any Allied fighter. Flight Testing The ME-262's first test flight took place on April 18, 1941. The intended turbojets were not ready, so they instead had to use a conventional propeller mounted on the prototype's nose. Once the two BMW 003 turbojet engines were finally ready for installation, the propeller was kept to prevent an accident in case of failure. Indeed, during the first test with the new engines, the turbojets failed, so it turned out to be incredibly fortuitous for the pilots that the engineers had left the conventional engines installed. After much work on the turbojets, a more refined version was ready for flight on July 18, 1942. Test pilot Fritz Wendel was tasked with flying the completed ME-262 from Leipheim in Bavaria. The retracting wheel gear at the tail was later removed, but at the time of takeoff that day, the wheel interfered with the jet exhaust, and turbulence from the wings cancelled out the tail elevators. The takeoff was cut short, and a second attempt had to be launched with Wendel tapping the brakes at takeoff speed to lift the horizontal tail away from the turbulence. To overcome this tail design problem, a tricycle landing gear system was later integrated on the fifth prototype and then a final, fully retractable gear was placed under the nose wheel for the sixth prototype. After continued issues with the BMW engine, the Germans settled on using the Junkers Jumo 004 engine, the world's very first turbojet engine, to be placed into production on an operational scale. It had completed a hundred hours of testing by 1943, but mass production was almost impossible due to its heavy weight and use of strategic raw materials that were short in supply. A new version had to be designed using cheaper materials, with heat-resistant metal parts being made from steel with aluminum coating as protection from oxidation. Using lower quality materials meant that the engine had to be overhauled for metallurgical tests on the turbine after only 25 hours, which would give it an additional lifespan of only 10 hours. After those 35 hours, the turbine wheel had to be replaced. This put the aircraft at a disadvantage against the British Power Jets W2700 turbojet engine used on the Gloucester Meteor, the only Allied jet aircraft used in combat during World War II. The British aircraft engine had an operational lifespan of up to 125 hours. Air Commodore Sir Frank Whittle would claim, quote, It was in the quality of high-temperature materials that the difference between German and British engines was most marked. By 1942, the ME-262 airframe was finalized and its speed goals had been met, but issues with engine reliability delayed production until 1944. Even then, only 28 planes were delivered in June, 59 were delivered in July, and only 20 were produced in August making a single ME-262 airframe cost 87,400 Reichsmark and consumed about 6,400 man-hours of work. Once in service, fuel supply problems further plagued the Messerschmitt ME-262 as it had to carry 2,000 liters of fuel in two tanks, one in the front and the other behind the cockpit, as well as in a 200-liter ventral fuselage tank. Fully fueled, the plane could spend between 60 to 90 minutes cruising, 
It consumed fuel at twice the rate of other freighters at the time, so the Germans had to install a low-fuel warning system in the cockpit. A serious plane. In April of 1944, the first ME-262s were delivered to field units, with the first recorded flight taking place on July 26th. On that occasion, an ME-262 shot a mosquito, which went down, but whose pilot managed to land safely in Italy. The first confirmed kill was reported on August 8th. Lieutenant General James H. Doolittle would recall how the existence of the plane came into view for the Allies' high command. Quote, The rumors of a super-fast German plane were being taken seriously. There were just too many corroborating reports from different sources not to take notice, but many of the pilots almost refused to believe. The innovative aircraft quickly began to affect morale among Allied pilots. The ME-262 was so fast that German pilots also had to adapt their tactics for attacks. The aircraft counted on a 30mm MK-108 cannon with short barrels and low muzzle velocity, meaning that from over 600 yards it was very inaccurate. The pilots needed to start firing at 500 yards, but also needed to break off at 200 yards to avoid a collision. This only gave them around two seconds for shooting, with 44 shells fired per second. ME-262 pilots learned to attack by piloting as if they were on a roller coaster. First, they would approach the target flying 5,900 feet higher, then they would enter shallow dives three miles away, positioning themselves 1,480 feet below the target. They would finally shoot as they pulled up, with their speed reduced. This tactic turned out to be rather successful. Eric Brown, a Royal Navy test pilot, spoke on the shortcomings of the ME-262, quote, This was a blitzkrieg aircraft. It was never meant to be a dogfighter. It was meant to be a destroyer of bombers. The great problem with it was that it did not have dive brakes. For example, if you want to fight and destroy a B-17, you come in on a dive. So you normally came in at 600 yards and would open fire on your B-17, and your closing speed was still high, and since you had to break away at 200 meters to avoid a collision, you only had two seconds firing time. Now in two seconds, you can't sight. You can fire randomly and hope for the best. If you want to sight and fire, you need to double that time to four seconds. And with dive brakes, you could have done that. The German pilots that did learn how to master the swift fighter saw a high rate of success against enemies. Among those were Georg Peter Eder and Erich Rudorfer, who took down 12 enemy fighters each. Despite the speed, high wing loading, and absence of brakes, the ME-262 was very maneuverable, with light and efficient controls, leading edge slats that increased lift by 35% in turns, and with an almost unprecedented ability to sustain a high speed during turns. These characteristics made the ME-262 nearly invincible while airborne. Hit them when they're down. The Allied powers discovered that the key to destroying the ME-262 was to attack it during landing and takeoff, or while it was parked on airfields, rather than when it was already in the air. The ME-262 proved almost impossible to counter when it was airborne because of its rate of climb and high speed. Yet at low speeds, it had a slow throttle response and did not provide enough thrust, making takeoff and landing ideal for targeting by enemies. Reconnaissance missions were undertaken by the Allies to locate and bomb ME-262 airfields throughout the last months of the war, with increasingly required bomber pilots to venture deeper into enemy territory, in turn putting them at greater risk of being taken down. Germany sought to defend itself through two main methods. The first was setting up discreetly placed anti-aircraft guns and leaving covered Focke-Wulf aircraft around airfields so that bombers lured in by an airfield could then be eliminated. The second method was to use parts of the Autobahn to land ME-262s so they could then be hidden in the forest. The Allies additionally allowed their P-51 Mustangs to leave their posts as escorts for bombers and destroyers so they could launch ahead and eliminate all moving targets. This particular change in tactics was credited by Adolf Josef Ferdinand Galland, Luftwaffe General Lieutenant, as the most effective for combating the ME-262s. The loss of qualified pilots proved devastating for the German jet fighter. Galland was quoted as saying, quote, Planes can be rebuilt, but men cannot be made. Wasted Potential By the end of the war, only 50 ME-262s had seen the battlefield, despite 1,430 having been built. The Messerschmitt ME-262 aircraft were often halted before even getting airborne, brought low by challenges with the engines and fuel shortages, or by the bombing of parked planes in airfields and production factories. The ME-262 was perhaps ahead of its time, but it helped usher in a new era for fighter aircraft. Under different conditions, with greater access to the required metals and fuel, the aircraft could have played a key role in the end of the war. But due to the cost of building it, the design challenges faced, and the lack of materials, 
Its role in the war has sometimes been described as almost negligible. Its role in post-war aviation history, however, is undeniable. The Allies studied captured planes, which resulted in the eventual adoption of features or concepts for the development of their own fighter jets.